Filipino grievances against Governor Wood is the product of a group of Filipino politicians who were driven to work together against a common political enemy due to circumstances. Jose Abad Santos and George Bocobo, two prominent lawyers at the time, are said to have drafted the document. Jose Abad Santos was born in the city of San Fernando in the province of Pampanga and the son of Vicente Abad Santos and Toribia Basco. He was a pensionado who went to a Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois to study law. He worked as an assistant attorney at the Bureau of Justice after passing the bar in 1911 and ultimately advanced to the position of attorney general. He served as the Senate President and Speaker of the House Representatives Chief Legal Counsel and it was during this time that he joined the Anti-Wood Campaign. He administered the oath of office to President Quezon and Vice President Osmania for their second term on December 30, 1941. Before leaving the nation, Quezon designated Abad Santos as the Commonwealth Government's Interim President. On April 11, 1942, the Japanese troops apprehended him in Barili City and sent him to Mindanao. In the presence of his son Pepito, he was executed on May 7, 1942 in Malabang, Danao. On October 19, 1886, George Bokobo was born in Gerona, Tarlac. He received his Bachelor of Law degree from India University in 1907 as part of the colonial government's pensionado program. He began his career as a law clerk at the Executive Bureau and began teaching at the University of the Philippines College of Law in 1911. He was a close associate of Manuel L. Quezon and one of his speech writers. On July 23, 1965, he passed away. Filipino grievances against Governor Wood was adopted from the book of Gregory Seidel. Documentary sources of Philippine history which he compiled, edited, and annotated with the help of his daughter, Sonia Saito. He is a notable historian, author, and politician from the Philippines' contributions to Philippine historical research. In 1920, Leonard Wood was sent to the Philippines together with William Cameron Forbes to check if the Filipinos had already satisfied with the conditions set by the Jones Law. The team conducted an exhaustive investigation and visited 48 provinces and 449 municipalities. The report exposed the Filipino politicians' corruption and patronage system during the Harrison era. It also caused the bankruptcy of the Philippine National Bank, Quezon. After Leonardo Wood retired from the U.S. Army in 1921, he was appointed by President Harding to become the Governor General of the Philippines. Wood opted to stay in the Philippines and remain Governor General until he died in 1927. During his governorship, he monitored closely the activities of the local politicians and corrected some of their misconducts. He also vetoed numerous bills that the Philippines legislature passed and appointed American military men in the key position under the executive branch, as known as the Cathy Cabinet. On top of this, he strengthened the powers and jurisdiction of the Governor General, which were significantly reduced during the Harrison period. The anti-wood sentiment of Filipino politicians ruptured on July 21, 1923 and the event that triggered it was the decision of Wood State Ray Conley, the chief of the by squad of the Manila Police Force, who was accused of receiving money from gambling lords. The case was spearheaded by Mr. El Mario, the secretary of the city mayor, who presented a fake telephone conversation between Conley and some gamblers. When Manila Mayor Ramon Fernandez referred the case to Governor Wood, the latter advised the mayor to bring the case in court. The court acquitted Conley and to save their face, Mayor Fernandez and Justice Secretary Josepi Laurel requested Wood to allow them to conduct an administrative investigation on Conley. Instead of granting the request, Wood created a board composed on the civil service director, the undersecretary of justice and an American colonel of the constabulary. The board found Conley not guilty and recommended his statement. Wood personally believed that Conley is innocent and the charges against him were just fabrication. 
of influential and well-connected personalities who are affected by this anti-gumping campaign. After he was acquitted, Conley resigned and Wood accepted it. Wood found him innocent of bribery, but he found him is guilty of keeping a mistress and for making false statements. Manila Mayor Ramon Fernandez and Justice Secretary Josepi Laurel felt insulted when they learned that the board created by Wood acquitted Conley. The decision put them in the bad light because it implied that the case they filed against Conley was weak. As a countermeasure, they explained to the people that Conley was acquitted not because he was innocent but because he was an American. Fernandez and Laurel tendered their resignation and Senate President Quezon and Speaker Manuel Rojas also resigned as a member of Council of State in support of Laurel and in protest of Wood's handling of the Conley case. Government would try to win back the support of those Filipino officials who gave up their position in his government. His gesture was not reciprocated and this prompted him to accept their resignation and replace them with their deputies. At the height of the crisis, various accusations were raised against Wood. Quezon and his allies also sent a cable to President Harding informing him of the reasons why they resigned en masse. They also told the president that they were planning to send a delegation to the United States that will explain to him Wood's blatant disregard of the rights and privileges granted to Filipinos by the previous administration. The document that will be presented below basically summarizes the grievances and disgust of Filipino politicians who were affected by Wood's reform and management style. About the document, the document Filipino grievances against Governor Wood is an example of a joint resolution expressing the legislators' disgust with the way Governor Wood was running the affair of the government. It may also be classified as a protest or a petition letter. This pattern of behavior recently resulted in the issue ones of Executive Order No. 37, in which he attempted to overturn laws establishing the Board of Control and assuming the body's powers. Executive Order No. 37 is about authorizing the grant of service, recognition, and sending to government employees for fiscal year 2020 Presidential Communications Operations Office. He has refused his assent to laws, which were the most wholesome and necessary heads of the department. He has set at note of the legal authority and responsibility for the Philippine heads of department. He has substituted his constitutional advisor for a group of military attaches without legal responsible to the people. He has reversed the policy of Filipinizing the service of the government by appointing Americans even when Filipinos of proven capacity were available. He has obstructed the carrying out of national economic policies duty adopted by the legislature. Really? because they are in conflict with his personal views. He has rendered merely perfunctory the power of legislature to pass the annual appropriation law by reviving items in the law of preceding year. After vetoing the corresponding items of the current appropriation act in the flagrant violation for organic law. He has made appointments to position and authorize the payment of salaries. Therefore, after having vetoed the appropriations of such salaries, he has used certain public funds to grant additional compensation to public officials in clear violation. He has arrogated unto himself the right of exercising the powers granted by law to the emergency board after abolishing said board on the ground that its powers involve an unlawful delegation of legislative authority. He has undoubtedly inferred in administration of justice. He has refused to obtain the advice of the Senate in making appointments where such advice required by the Organic Act. He has refused to submit the Senate appointment for vacancies occurring during the recess of the legislature in contravention of the Organic Act. He has continued in office nominees whose appointment had been rejected by the Senate. He has unsurped 
legislative powers by imposing conditions on legislative measures approved by him. He has in the administration of affairs in the brought about a condition which has given rise to discord and dissension between certain groups of Christians and Mohammedan Indians. He has by his policies created strained relations between resident Americans and Filipinos. He has endeavored, on the pretext of getting the government out of business, to dispose of all the companies capitalized by the government worth many millions of the people's money to powerful American interests. He has sanctioned the campaign of insidious propaganda in the United States against Filipino people and the aspirations. He has attempted to close the Philippine National Bank, so necessary to the economic development of the country. He has adopted the practice of intervening in and controlling directly to its minute details. The affairs of the Philippine government, both insular and local, in violation of self-government. He has insistently sought the amendment of our laws approved by the Congress of the United States, which amendment would open up the resources of our country to exploitation by predatory means. The document serves as a request for governor's goods impeachment. As a result of this situation, Filipinas were encouraged to put their personal and political interests aside and unify against the Wood government. The document is an eyewitness narrative that serves as a significant documentation of the true events and activities at the time. It is a useful indication that we need to learn to stand on our own two feet and be self-sufficient. And lastly, we must learn not to put our trust simply because we don't know their true motives.